hi there, my name is Vic Vier. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London and today I'm going to tell you about all the things you should be doing if you have hay fever. So this advice would be the sort of advice you get from any UK GP or ENT consultant in the country and by the end of the video you will learn about some of the things that I did when I learned about hay fever back at medical school last century which in my case helped me get rid of my hay fever altogether or pretty much altogether. But before we get on to that I'm going to start off with talking about prevention. What I mean by prevention is trying to avoid the allergy in the first place and I think most people in this country know that pollen rates are highest in the mornings and in the sort of late afternoons as the sun's starting to go down. So do your very best to avoid going outside at these times because the more pollen in the air means that you'll get more symptoms of your hay fever. But it's worth remembering that clothes and hair outside pick up a lot of pollen. So if you walk in, really you ought to be changing your clothes and maybe even having a shower, getting rid of all the, uh, the, the pollen from your hair. Luckily I'm completely immune to that problem. But uh, it's worth changing your clothes, having a shower, cool yourself down, that gets rid of the pollen inside. And knowing this also means that you should avoid drying your clothes outside in the washing line at these sorts of times. Try and do it in the midday sun because that's when the pollen count is its lowest. It may be also worth, once you come inside, to clean your nose out with some salt water. Most people in this country use something known as Sterimar, which is basically rather expensive French seawater and you just squirt it up your nose and it clears out all the allergens from your nose so it doesn't sit there and carry on causing these symptoms of blocked nose, sneezing, irritability, itchiness, all that sort of stuff. I've left a link in the video description below and it's the slightly more salty version because it also opens up your nose rather naturally as well, not for very long but it is just salt water basically. There is actually another spray you could use which is a sort of basically a cellulose spray that you spray up your nose and what that does is create a barrier from the outside well and your, the nasal lining, the, the, the lining of your nose. So when you spray this into your nose before you go outside, before you encounter all these allergens, it can't actually get to your lining of your skin. Now I've not used this before myself, but I'll leave a link to, uh, the, I think an Amazon uh, site has it as well. So you can just link onto that as well. Now there are some situations when pollen counts do get higher, not just in the mornings, in the afternoon, but also after mowing the lawn. And interestingly, a lot of people have problems after a stormy weather, like the summer storms that people get, lightning and thunder particularly, because there's an awful lot of moisture in the air. And that moisture, uh, it sort of gets absorbed absorbed by the pollen. The pollen expands and then splits into lots of little different pieces. So instead of there being just one bit of pollen, you get multiple types. So going out after a summer storm, there's an awful lot of uh, pollen in the air, so it gets multiplied several times. And there's an awful lot of wind as well, so it stirs it up. Equally, a lot of people with hay fever also have asthma. And actually the lightning causes a lot of weird nitrogen compounds in the air, which sparks off a lot of people's asthma. So try and avoid that time around a summer storm because it can spark off your asthma and your hay fever. Try and keep the windows and the doors closed in your house. Try and keep the inside of your house like a sanctuary against pollen and allergens. So at least you know you're relatively safe inside. But if you're worried about the amount of pollen inside the house, you can get these HEPA filter air purifier things. I think a lot of cars have it as well. They can clear out the air in the car so you can drive around without getting that problem. Again, I've left a link for that air purifier in the video description below. With people who get an awful lot of eye symptoms outside, it may be worth using sunglasses because the evidence seems to suggest that wearing sunglasses protects you from getting some of these symptoms. Obviously it's not great because the pollen still gets there, but it stops the glare, I guess, and, and the irritability of your eyes. And lastly, there are quite a few drugs out there that do cause the symptoms of hay fever to get worse. And rather than going through them all, I'm just going to leave a long list of them just here so you can have a look at them. And you can pause the video here if you want and just check that if you're, you're any one of those. You can maybe ask your GP or someone just to see if there's an alternative one to one of them. So now that we've got through prevention, it's time to get onto some of the medication you can take. I'm going to start off with antihistamines. There are actually three different types of antihistamines you can take. One for a spray for the nose, drops for the eyes, and a tablet. If I was trying to advise someone to work out which one they should use, I'd say, well, the oral tablet seems to work in most areas except for nasal obstruction. It doesn't do much for nasal obstruction. So if your nose is blocked and that's your main problem, then it's not really worth taking an oral tablet of antihistamines. You see, antihistamines work best for the itchy eyes, sneezing, drippy, watery nose, and the sneezing, that sort of thing, and, and also the irritable eyes. Now, if you use an antihistamine nasal spray, that seems to work a little bit better for a blocked nose, but nowhere near as good as um, nasal steroids, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the nasal antihistamine sprays don't really work very well for the eyes. And so there are some eye drops as well, antihistamine eye drops, that can reduce some of the redness and the itchiness in the eyes as well. And I think the main problem about taking antihistamines is that they are slightly sedating. They make you feel slightly tired. And so uh, I think fexofenadine is the one that's least sedating. And a lot of my patients have got obstructive sleep apnea, so I don't particularly like them taking antihistamines. And the other problem is that there was a European trial that 
looked at a lot of these antihistamines and they found that some patients who were taking these drugs seemed to get cardiac problems, arrhythmias and things like that. There were actually even a few deaths with taking antihistamines. So tefenidine caused a prolongation QT syndrome, all those sorts of rather worrying things. So with my population, a lot of sleep apnea patients and elderly patients with heart problems, I slightly worry about giving antihistamines, but I think most people are fine to take them. If you use the nasal preparation or the eye drops, it's often a lot safer, we believe. The only problem with the nasal spray is that it doesn't taste very nice and it can change your sense of taste as well, given if you give it for a long time. But typically nasal sprays or antihistamine sprays work within 15 minutes. But that's very different from nasal steroids, which are the mainstay of treatment for people with a blocked nose with their hay fever. So nasal steroid sprays are by far the most effective treatment for a nasal blockage with hay fever. But you have to make sure that you use these nasal sprays correctly otherwise you'll get some of the side effects and you won't get the most effectiveness out of them so uh, I've got another video here if you look at that it'll teach you how to use the nasal sprays correctly but typically you need to spray this into your nose aim it sort of towards the, the lining of your nose on the outside which is where the turbinates are that swell up again this is all in that video and you need to hold it in your nose don't sniff it up because if you sniff it up it'll just go down the back of your throat and it'll be gone so try and breathe through your mouth and let it sort of sit there and marinate a little bit. It is also worth using the salt water spray, that Sterimar, hypertonic Sterimar spray just before because you clean out some of that mucus in there. So when the spray goes into your nose, it hits the actual lining of your nose rather than the mucus where it doesn't really do anything. It's also important that you use the correct type of nasal sprays, the steroid sprays, because some of them sort of go through your whole body and give you all the side effects of steroids. Whereas some of the slightly more expensive ones like uh, Pyrenase, Flutixone Propanate, uh, Nasonex, uh, Avamis, all those ones, they seem to stay in the nose and don't spread out through the whole body. So you don't get all the horrible side effects of steroids. So it's, those are much safer. Whereas things like Beccanase and things like that, you can't use them for more than three months because of the, the risk to your own, your own body by taking too many steroids. The main problem about using steroid nasal sprays is they take a long time for them to work. You, you almost have to start using the steroid sprays two or three weeks before the start of your hay fever season. And what happens is that you spray it up your nose and it takes maybe two or three days before you even notice the difference. And then it slowly builds up until about two, three, maybe four weeks time, you're at that level where they actually work in your nose. They don't really work before then. And the idea is that they build up one step at a time. If you miss a few doses, you have to start all over again up that ladder. So what I tend to do is tell people to leave it by their toothbrush because you take two sprays each nostril twice a day at uh, and because it's twice a day, you can leave it by your toothbrush and as long as you remember to brush your teeth, hopefully you remember to take your sprays as well in the, with the correct technique. Again, it's in that video that I talked about earlier. Occasionally people get a burning sensation with these steroid sprays and that's because of some of the preservatives inside the steroid spray. In that case, it may be worth swapping over to a different type like Rhinocort or uh, Flixinase nasals doesn't have some of these preservatives that cause a burning sensation in the nose. In the UK, we do have a combination drug called Demista. And Demista is great because it's got a steroid nasal spray, which is one of the, the good quality ones that stay in your nose, don't spread anywhere and also it has an antihistamine in it. And the two together work very well. It doesn't taste great, but it is really, really effective. The most effective spray for hay fever. So it's worth going to your GP and asking if you're sort of eligible to start using this nasal spray. Now I appreciate this video is coming out in the middle of the hay fever season. So some of you may be completely blocked up and trying to use a spray now will just hit this big stuffed up nose and come straight back out again and you won't get anywhere. So there are two ways to try and get these steroid nasal sprays up into your nose because at the, at the start it won't do anything because it's not actually getting in there. So one option is to take some oral steroids. Now that's a big thing for some people, taking a large heavy dose of oral steroids to open up your nose, make you feel better for a few days. And then you can use the steroid sprays that actually gets into your nose. And hopefully by the time the oral steroids have worn off, the, the, the nasal steroids have started working and that's relatively safe. Some people with a high blood pressure, glaucoma or some other problems may not want to take a steroid spray. So the other option would be to use a decongestant spray such as uh, Otravine, Sinex and all those other things. You have to be really careful with those because you can't take them more for, than a, two or three days. A lot of people go, oh my God, this is a great spray and they carry on using it and, and then they realize that they're actually starting to get addicted to it, a thing called rhinitis medicamentosa. I've got a video on the dangers of using these decongestant sprays, so please don't get stuck on uh, Sinex, Otravine, Olbus oil, you know, all those uh, other types of sprays. Try and avoid all those, for, don't take them for too long. But if you're only using them for a day or two, just so you can get these sprays up into your nose and, and hopefully that will work better, 
then that's okay. But probably worth talking about it with your GP because sometimes some people can't use the decongestant sprays. Like pregnant ladies can't use a decongestant spray because it uh, reduces the blood flow to the, to the baby as well. There is actually another class of drug which I haven't spoken about already. It's called an anti-leukotriene or in this country most people use Montelukast. Now most doctors only really prescribe this if you have asthma as well as hay fever and both are sort of kicking off. And it's quite useful in those people who it's very difficult to control. Something on top of all the other things I've talked about. Now the last drug that I haven't really talked about that not many people use is ipratropium bromide or Rhinotec. And this spray is only really useful for a drippy nose. You spray this into your nose within about 15-20 minutes, everything dries up and it, it doesn't work on the blocked nose, itchy eye, sneezing, all those other things. But it can be useful for people who've got a very drippy nose. Now one of the last things I want to talk about in terms of medication is immunotherapy. And I think this has been a real game changer over the last sort of 20 years or so. In the old days when say children are trying to get through their GCSEs or A levels, you had to get a depot injection of uh, steroids. So you just inject it in and that lasts for the whole of the summer. Now we've realized over the years that actually giving huge amounts of steroid that last for a whole summer season. Although people feel better and they can get through their exams, the risk benefit ratio is not really good. And generally now nobody really prescribes these drugs anymore. But what we are starting to move across to is immunotherapy. And this is almost like teaching your immune system not to react to the pollen. Explain to the immune system that it's not anything serious and stop reacting to it. Now, actually, I was in one of the early trials back um, 20, 30 years ago where I was given some of this stuff because I had really bad hay fever at the time. I was constantly taking nasal sprays. And I was one of the fortunate ones. It worked really well on me. I now hardly get hay fever at all. I sometimes get some itchy eyes, particularly when I'm mowing the lawn or something like that. But it really, it's, it's fantastic fantastic or it has been for me because it's effectively a cure for hay fever and now since all those research trials have gone through the, the way that they're giving it out now is it's sort of like a dissolvable tab that goes underneath your tongue and there, there are other ways of giving this drug. Generally in the UK the only way you can get this is to go to an allergy clinic see an allergist because the main problem is that people get quite severe reactions to it sometimes uh, so the first dose you give you need to be in a place where there's resuscitation somewhere where if you suddenly start bloating up you have a you have to have someone to you know put a tube down your throat or, or give you lots of steroids or basically a place of safety when you take your first dose to be honest i'm so scared of this that if i would do it i would bring patients into theater with an anaesthetist with an allergist and me just in case something terrible goes wrong and i have to do an operation to open up the airway and then we give the first doses I guess it would be a very boring first dose because most people are absolutely fine, but it needs to be done through an allergy clinic or an allergist. It's very important that way. And each of these drugs are based on a separate allergen. So you do need to know exactly what you're allergic to. I remember when I had my skin prick test, which is these little pin pricks in your arm and you work and you put different allergens on. Uh, when I had grass, my arm swelled up and I couldn't use my arm for about three or four days. It was really quite bad. So I worked out uh, it was a good option for me to have immunotherapy. But you need to find exactly what you're allergic to so you know which um, anti-therapy you should be taking, any sort of this immunotherapy you should be taking. Once you've been deemed safe to take this dissolvable tab under your tongue, you can go home and use it every day underneath your tongue for about two or three years and slowly but surely your hay fever will get slightly better. As I said, this has been a complete game changer for me. I remember my summers being completely miserable. I had to stay inside and it was just awful watching all my friends running around outside. So if none of these sprays or other potions and antihistamines seem to be working for you, speak to your GP and get referred over to an allergy clinic and they'll be able to help you with this immunotherapy. Now there are some surgical options you can do where basically you're shrinking down the turbinates or the lining of your nose so you can breathe better. There's a less of a chance of you getting blocked up but surgical options don't get rid of an allergy at all. So you'll still have the drippy nose, possibly the sneezing, itchy eyes and all those sorts of things. It can just help with the unblocking of the nose. So if you want more information about that, there are some videos on my channel which describe a septoplasty, which is repairing a twisted nose and reducing the turbinates inside your nose so it shrinks down so you can breathe a bit better behind it. Now, along with hay fever, some people have allergies to house dust mite, which seems to last for the whole year. So if you've got that problem, there is a video here that you can look at which describes how you should help yourself avoid getting house dust mite and the treatments available for that. And if you look in the video description below, I do do a newsletter and a free ebook for house dust mite. And if you sign up for the newsletter, I will be sending some emails about hay fever and hopefully that will help you. I'll put a bit more detail in that because you can't put too much detail in YouTube. Everyone gets bored of me. Anyway, on saying that, do take care. I hope this has been useful. Bye-bye.